Okay, this morning we're going to talk about are you a truther? Alright, now this is a, a news media term for somebody that believes that 9-11 was an inside job. Okay, and it's really kind of stupid when you think about it uh, to come up with a term, a derogatory, supposedly derogatory term like truther. Because what's the opposite of truther? Falser. <laughs> Falser, liar, deceiver. <laughs> you know, I mean, why would you say, oh, you're one of those truthers? I mean, that's kind of a stupid thing to say. I mean, it's really kind of dumb. But you say, well, what about 9-11? September the 11th of 2001. Do you believe it was an inside job? Yes, I do. I really do. And it's not because I've fallen for a bunch of quacky, kooky conspiracy theories. It's because I've looked at it. I've studied it. Okay, it doesn't make any sense that 19 hijackers hijacked airplanes, slammed them into our buildings, the buildings fell straight down, and we couldn't do anything to stop them. That's pretty stupid, okay? And there is, I mean, I wouldn't believe in it if there wasn't so much evidence. But, I mean, you could spend an hour and not cover one one-hundredth of the evidence for the thing. I mean, just to hit a couple, building number seven wasn't hit by an airplane. One of the buildings, it wasn't even near, <clears throat> it was across the street from the north and south tower, and the thing came down. And there were buildings right beside the north and south tower that didn't come down you know it, it just doesn't make any sense and you had the bbc report where a woman is saying about the building number seven has has in fact fallen and right behind her you can see the skyline new york city skyline and building number seven still standing and all of a sudden the bbc video feed kind of starts to get blurry and then fades out and a guy oh we lost her uh-huh yeah, the BBC, they don't have very good video equipment there, you know. They'll try to afford some better, you know, occasionally here. Right. You know, and if you are kind of on the fence about this, you really don't know what to believe, well, I can say this. Either you can contact us and we'll send you free information on 9-11, or you can just get online. You can go to YouTube. You can look up 9-11 in plain sight. Plane, P A L or P L A N E, you know, not with an I there. 9 11 in plain sight and loose change. Watch either or both of those videos and you will be shown evidence, not a bunch of weird people standing around. You'll see firefighters saying we heard explosives as the buildings were coming down. There were bombs set in the buildings. You'll hear all that stuff. And by the way, if you're a Christian and you're listening to this and you're thinking all oh, this, you know, these people are nuts, uh, fit this thing into Bible prophecy. The Bible says that there would be a one world government in the end times. And that's what the conspiracy theory is all about. But if you don't believe in that, if you say, oh, you know, I don't believe this 9-11 inside job stuff, how's that fit into the Bible? We have a war against terrorism and we're going to have freedom and everything. How does that fit into Bible prophecy? It doesn't. Okay, so there's really nothing wrong with the 9-11 thing, you know, if you're a Christian. It lines up perfectly with the Bible, it being an inside job. Okay, but the whole thing here is this term, truther. The fact of the matter is that we as Christians should be the ones that know the most truth. And the fact that most quote-unquote Christians today a lot of them are living in deception and lies and they don't know what's going on. It just shows you how rotten and wicked these big buildings that we call churches are. There are people that are coming out of churches that don't know anything. And the lost world sees it. And it's a rotten testimony. We're going to get into that as we go through this study. Okay? And um, so what about the Bible? What does the Bible have to say about truth? Well, I can tell you right now that the greatest source of truth on this planet is right here, the King James Bible. This thing tells you what happened, what's going on today, and what's going to happen in the future. No other book does that. There is no other book, holy book, the Koran or the uh, Hindu scriptures, book of, book of Mormon, whatever. There's no other sacred writings, quote-unquote, that can predict, accurately predict the future. They all are the things get better and better and better. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
Okay, the Bible teaches that things get worse before they get better. <laughs> a lot worse. Okay, but let's look at what we're going to go through the scriptures today. We're going to start and kind of go through, take a walk through the scripture. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about the subject of truth. And we're going to see if you are a truther, a real truther. We're going to start out in Deuteronomy, back in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1. It says here, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as, distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now notice verse 4. This is very interesting. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, there's a brother out west, uh, Brother Mike Hoggard, and that guy gets into the, the, the number system within the Bible. And it's, it's, there's so much depth to it and, and things lining up and whatever. There's no way that this book was written by men. God used 54 men back in 1604 to 1611 to write this down, but God's Holy Spirit was working through those men. This is not a man-made book. There's no way that you could have such depth and complexity. Okay, no other book is like this King James Bible. Just an amazing book, celebrating its 400th anniversary this year, by the way. But look at verse, verse 4. There are seven aspects of God in verse 4. Number one, he is the rock. And you'll see that all throughout Scripture. Okay, In your New Testament, Jesus Christ is the foundation that we build upon as Christians. Well, a good foundation is rock. Okay, And uh, some demented, perverted professional wrestler calling himself the rock too by the way he's just a hell-bound sinner and he's going to burn in hell for all of eternity unless he gets saved okay and if he gets saved he needs to quit calling himself by one of god's titles he's a blasphemous little idiot okay number two his work is perfect it's not his work is adequate it's perfect god knows exactly what he's doing okay he has the whole thing planned out his ways are judgment. We look down here and we say, I don't understand why, you know, why do the wicked prosper? It says another part in the Bible. God's got it worked out. Okay? Sometimes the Lord will allow somebody to be wicked down here and get away with a lot of devilment only because He's going to punish them for all of eternity. Don't worry about judgment. It's all going to work out. Okay, and if you are a quote-unquote truther and you're aware of the conspiracy, it's very frustrating sometimes to see these guys that are literally higher than the law. They can kill, they can rape, they can steal, do whatever, and they never, get, they never go to prison, they never get judged down here on this earth. But God's going to judge them, and God's going to do a good job of it. Okay, his ways are judgment. Okay, number four, he is a God of Truth. What's the source of truth? God. And we're going to see that as we continue here. He is without iniquity. God cannot sin. God cannot lie. And that's something else too, by the way. You want to be a truther? You really want to know where the truth is at? You better go to somebody that is without iniquity. And you're only going to find that in the Bible. You're only going to find that from Almighty God. A lot of the conspiracy researchers out there are not without iniquity. And we're going to talk more about them, too, as we continue. He is just. And number seven, he is right. You say, you think your God is right and everybody else is wrong? Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. Oh, but maybe he's wrong in one point. No. No, he's right all the time. He's never wrong. He's without iniquity. Okay? Now, as I said earlier, show me one other God 
that can claim those seven things right there. There aren't any. We say, what about Allah? Allah's not just. Allah will kill you if you're not a Muslim. And even if you are a Muslim, did you know the word love does not appear in the Quran in relation to Allah? Allah doesn't love his people. Even if you want to believe that Allah is a, is a real God, he's not. He's just a moon God. He's a false God. See? What about Buddha? Did Buddha ever die for anybody? Did Buddha ever do anything to love anyone? No. Absolutely not. And you go down through all the other gods out there, none of them have those seven qualifications right there in Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. But we'll continue here. We're going to be hitting a lot of scriptures today. Turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24 verse 14. It says here, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, you're going to need to choose who you serve. You say, well, you know, I, I'll accept 9-11 truth, and I'll accept the truth about harp, and about chemtrails, and about fluoridation, and and about, you know, vaccination and all the other stuff. But I don't know if I could serve Jesus Christ. Oh, what are you going to serve then? Well, I think I'd like to be a Buddhist. Okay. Buddha doesn't deliver. Buddha can't save you. He never claimed he could. <laughs> you know, it's just ridiculous. And by the way, it talks there about on the other side of the flood, the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. Back before the flood which was the very first time God judged the whole world without exception, they had other gods that they were worshiping, and guess what? They couldn't deliver them. There was only one family that was spared. Okay? And there was never a time since then when God judged the whole earth. But there's coming a time. And that flood in the days of Noah, it didn't last for seven years. God's coming wrath and judgment is going to last for seven years. You know, if you didn't make it to the ark, and nobody did but Noah's family, if you didn't make it there, you drowned. Those people, those wicked people, were probably dead within a couple of hours of that flood starting. You know, maybe a day they might have survived. But it's not going to be that way in the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming. That's seven years of God's wrath and God's judgment. Okay? And there's a way out too, by the way. And one of the lies that you're going to be told by a lot of the conspiracy crowd is that there is no rapture. There's no pre-tribulation rapture. Guys like Alex Jones will tell you that. That's a lie. Okay? God raptured one man before the flood. Who was it? Enoch. Enoch, Enoch was translated that he might not see death. The Bible says he was taken and nobody could find him. And it's going to be the same way with the body of Christ. And it's coming very quickly. And if you're listening to this thing and you're a truther and you want to know truth, you better you better research the Bible for yourself. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but there's coming a time when God's going to judge this earth and it's going to be horrible. Worse than the flood in the days of Noah. Really, really bad. And if you need to, if you want to be saved, you're going to have to put away your false gods because they're not going to deliver you from God's wrath that's about to come to this planet. First Samuel chapter 12. Turn over there next. First Samuel chapter 12 verses 20 through 25. Now a lot of the things that are written in the Old Testament were written specifically to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people. But we can apply them to today and learn a lot of things. You know, there's a statement, a famous statement among truthers, 
And that is, if you are, do not learn from the lessons of history, you're doomed to repeat it. And that's very true. Okay? And you'll find that in your Bible as you study. But it says here, 1 Samuel 12, verse 20, And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. But if ye shall do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. The way you preserve a nation is not by standing and fighting for the Constitution and joining the Oath Keepers and writing your congressman. That doesn't do it. It's departing from iniquity. Fearing the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That doesn't mean you're running around cowering and hiding and God's going to kill me, God's going to kill me. That doesn't mean that. It means that you'll do what the Lord uh, wants you to do and you won't fear what man thinks about it. Okay? Fear the Lord. But if you do wickedly, if you turn to vain things, if you start messing around with the New Age movement and saying we should just have peace and we should love one another and put aside our differences and have, you know, celebrate diversity and all that other junk, God's not going to deliver you. Okay? You're going to be consumed with the wicked. And God's going to get the king, too, by the way. And we have a very, very wicked president right now. And God would be very justified in taking that guy down, especially as he messes around with the nation of Israel. And by the way, it said there in verse 24 that you should consider how great things he hath done for thee. You should be thankful Thank God for the life that He's given you. Thank Him for the food and the and you know the money and clothing and a place to stay and whatever else. You should be thankful before the Lord. Now we're going to go to First Kings chapter seventeen. First Kings chapter seventeen, verse twenty-four. Here you have a story about a prophet of God named Elijah, and there's a woman that he's staying with, and her little boy dies, and She's upset, obviously, and Elijah brings him back to life. And it says here in verse 24, And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is truth. You know, that should be said of a Christian. The word of the Lord should be in our mouth. And people should see that we know the truth. And something that's very, very convicting and I'm trying to work on in my own life is that I believe your vocabulary should be based upon the King James Bible. I don't necessarily mean that you should go around saying thee and thou and, and things like that. But what I mean is, if you're saying words that don't appear in God's book here, where are you getting them from? This King James Bible says man. <clears throat> it does not say human being. It says congregation. It does not say community. Okay, and for the conspiracy crowd out there that might be listening to this message, what about George Orwell's 1984? Right. What was one of the things? New speech. Yep. Let's change the speech. Hey, you want, you want to know one of the greatest expressions of freedom? It's your speech. If you are able to speak and speak freely without fear of imprisonment, you're living in a free society. But when you have to monitor your speech or else you'll, you're living in fear of being, you know, put in prison or something because of your speech, you're no longer living as a free man. Okay? But your speech as a Christian should be based upon this King James Bible. When you rebuke people, it should be rebukes that came out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus or out of other places in Scripture. And that's something I personally need to work on. Uh, Psalm 19 verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Important to remember. Turn to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. 
Psalm 25. <clears throat> it says here, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth. And teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. And by the way, let me just stop there. If you get saved, you're still a sinner. You're just a sinner that's saved by grace. Your sinful flesh doesn't go away at salvation. <laughs> it stays. Okay? Uh, verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Don't be so self-righteous that you think that you're not a sinner. Right there is your attitude that you should have. Verse 11. Okay, verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net, Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O bring thou me out of my distress. Distresses. Verse 18. Look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, <laughs> and they hate me with cruel hatred. Why do you think they call you a truther? Because they hate you? <laughs> you know? Verse 20, O keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. And by the way, that's not just for back in the Old Testament. That's for today, too. We should be praying for that God would redeem Israel, which he will, you know, eventually. But there's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming. Okay? Um, turn to Psalm 117. Psalm 117. And we're going to read the whole psalm here. Okay. See if we can get this done by the end of the sermon. <laughs> psalm 117, verse 1. O oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations, praise him, all ye people, for his mercies, or for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. <clears throat> well, we got through it. <laughs> now, a couple things you need to see there. First of all, you should be praising the Lord. And a nation that praises the Lord is one that God will bless. And you say, well, why is America so bad and rotten? Because people don't really praise the Lord anymore. What's called praise and worship in the average modern church is praise and worship of the people that are up on the stage. The modestly dressed women and the, the men up there that, whatever, you know, that have, that are filled with pride and are up there because of their ego. That's not praise. That's not praising the Lord. Okay, the kind of junk that goes on in the churches is not praise, not true praise. But verse 2 there, it says, The truth of the Lord endureth forever. It's not something that, well, the truth is just, you know, your opinion and my opinion, and, you know, when you're dead, truth will be, your truth dies with you. Uh-uh. The truth of the Lord endureth forever. Okay, and we're going to see that as we continue here. Um, turn to Psalm 119. <clears throat> Psalm 119 Verse 41. We're going to see here the source of truth. 
Psalm 119, verse 41, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. Okay? God's word is the only true, perfect, absolute source of truth on this planet. Nothing else is. Okay, turn to Psalm 138, verse 2. Some people say, well, you know, I don't think I'd make a big deal about the Bible. You know, it's not really that important of an issue. Yes, it is. Psalm 138, verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That's a verse that you should have memorized. God's word is the single most important physical possession on this planet. Period. Psalm 145. Psalm 145, verse 17. <clears throat> it says here, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth, preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Hmm. You say, well, I, I don't know. I'd kind of like to find out about salvation, what true salvation is. Where do I need to go? Do I need to go over to Tibet and go through the mountains and find this little guy that lives up on a hut on top of one of the hills? No. Do I need to travel to some city over in Rome, Vatican City, to try and find it? No. Don't go there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that'd be the worst place to go. How do you find salvation? How do you find God? He's nigh thee. He's available. Wherever you're at. You don't have to come here to this church and talk to one of us or something. You know, you don't have to do that. You can find God right in your own home. Okay, God is omnipresent. Our God's not some small little guy that's a golden statue in uh, Thailand or something. You know, that's not a God you want to worship. If you have to travel to Mecca to worship a God, he's a false God. You want a God who's available and can meet you wherever you are. All right? Not a false one. But it says there, The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. It might look like the global international banksters are getting away with things right now, but they're going to be judged. Our God's a God of judgment, a God of justice. And it's all going to work out in the end. Okay? Proverbs chapter 12 Turn, turn over to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19. The Bible said about his truth endureth forever. Look what it says here in Proverbs 12, 19. The lip of truth, excuse me, the lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. It's interesting, how many times have the modern mainstream media prostitutes, how many times have they been proven wrong? How many times have they been caught lying and had to change their story? It's what they do for a living. They're professional liars. And, you know, you go down through the list, there's a lot of people who make their living lying. You know, it's just incredible. But the fact is, the lip of truth shall be established forever. Was 9-11 an inside job? Yeah. I don't know all the details. I don't. I can't name the guys that, that put the thing together. I don't know everything about it. But it was definitely an inside job. Sure. Yeah. And that's going to be established forever. When we get to be with the Lord someday, it'll be, you know, people say, yeah, 9-11, yep, yeah, definitely an inside job. Sure. Yeah. But you see, if you come to that conclusion but miss salvation through Jesus Christ, eh, you're missing it. Okay, it's not a good thing. Look down at verse 22 in Proverbs chapter 12. 
It says here, lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Kind of interesting, Revelation 21, verse 8, if you want to go to the end of time there, the great white throne judgment, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and, and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, if you're a truther and you know all about what's going on, the international conspiracy and everything else, and yet you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to spend eternity with the people, these bad people that you've studied about. Think about that. It's good to study the truth, but you've got to come to the ultimate source of truth, which we're going to talk about that as we continue. But look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 23. It says here, A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. There are times and places when you should be careful who you talk to. And even if you, there's an opportunity there and everything for you to talk about some of the conspiracy stuff, don't just start pouring it out on people. Okay, the Bible talks about not feeding new believers with meat, strong meat. You feed them with milk first till they can handle the strong meat. The conspiracy thing is a very huge issue. There's a lot of angles to what makes up a truther. Okay, Be careful who you're talking to and how much you say to them. You have to discern that stuff. But it's interesting there, the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. That's the people that believe the lies of the mainstream media. They'll go around and blab, 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 global warming, and we shot Osama bin Laden, he's dead now, and, and he was the big bad guy, and now we're safe from Al-Qaeda, and, you know... They proclaim foolishness. And it's a lot easier to speak as a fool than it is to speak the truth. Okay. Proverbs chapter 16. Jump over to Proverbs 16, verse 6. It says here, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Okay. When you find out what's going on, in this world and you see this world isn't the happy little nice place that you were led to believe uh, growing up you should be led to God okay you should be led to wanting to know about God wanting to know the Lord okay it shouldn't mess you up more okay if that's what's happening that's not the intent of, of truth turn to Ecclesiastes the next book over from Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17. And I had to throw this in here. The word truth is not mentioned, but we're going to see something here. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17 and 18 says here, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Now, if you are aware, I mean, there are so many things that you can study in the truther movement, and it's quite vexing. It's very vexing, and it leads to quite a bit of sorrow. And we're going to see about that as we continue on here. Uh, the Bible talks about being acquainted with sorrow. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to read about a man here that was acquainted with sorrow. Isaiah chapter 53. All right, it says here, verse 1, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Sounds like a pretty interesting guy. Went through a lot of things, didn't he? And he was killed, he was executed, and it wasn't his fault. He was innocent. And he bore the sins of many. Now who's this talking about? Turn to John chapter 1. I'm going to go to the New Testament now. John chapter 1. And we're going to see who this man was. John chapter 1, verse 1. Now remember we read earlier about the Word of God being truth. Let's read here. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now notice there the Word is capitalized in your King James Bible. Okay? That's the manifest Word, not the written Word. But we'll see that the there's similarity between the two as we continue. Verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Let me just stop there. He's saying in verse 8 there, John is saying, I'm not the light, I just came to bear witness of the light. We're going to see who the light is here as we continue. Uh, verse 9, That was the true light which, uh, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. This is the man of Isaiah chapter 53. Okay, um, verse 11, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There's that T word again. Full of grace and truth. Okay? A couple things here I want to make a point of. This man... Uh, is called the light, capital L. Now you say, oh, you know, maybe it's a Illuminati thing here and, and, you know, the Masonic thing of what do you most desire? Light. What do you want, you know, second degree in masonry? More light, you know. You know that's not what's going on here. You see, there are two light things here, or light bearers, you could say, in the Bible. There's one the light, and then there's another one called Lucifer. And if you know anything at all, Lucifer is worshipped by the Masons and by a lot of the high-level Satanists. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this creature named Lucifer is also called, it says that he appears as an angel of light. Okay? And this Lucifer, also called Satan in the Bible, he 
specializes in counterfeiting the true light and counterfeiting what God does. That's what he does there. And it's interesting because a lot of people in the truth or movement, they learn the truth of what's going on in the world. They see what Satan and his followers are doing. But then Satan will tweak the truth a little bit and they'll actually get these truther people to end up following the occult. You know, it's really kind of ridiculous. It's interesting. There was a, a video uh, that came out there about the Bohemian Grove thing. How, you know, they went back a couple years later. Alex Jones and some guys went in there and, and got some film of the ceremony. And they went back a couple years later and there were witches and pagans which came to protest and to put spells on the people inside the thing. It's like, wait a second. You're opposing the occult with the occult. <laughs> yeah, that's stupid. Okay? And you have a lot of the people that speak out, you know, speak out, quote unquote, against the New World Order, and you look at them, and they're Knights of Malta, they're Masons, they're New Agers. And it's like, you're, you're part of the same crew. This is stupid. You don't have the true light that lighteth every man that cometh to it. You don't have that true light. And we're going to see what this true light is as we continue here. Uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Uh, we're going to start at verse 16. Most people know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And you say, oh good, then we all go to heaven. Uh-uh. Keep reading. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Why do men reject Jesus Christ? Because their deeds are evil. See, you can know the truth of what's going on in the conspiracy circles, but the fact is, if you aren't willing to give up your sins, your sinful life, if you aren't willing to submit to this book, you're going to go to hell with the same people that you supposedly oppose. Okay? If you reject Jesus Christ, you're condemned already. You say, oh, you mean I'm condemned after the first time I reject Jesus? Absolutely. It only takes one time to be condemned. That's just the way it is. Now, God oftentimes is long-suffering. He's patient with people. He'll let you reject, and he'll give you opportunities to be saved. If you still have breath in you, you still have an opportunity to get saved. But every time you reject Jesus Christ, it's going to be harder and harder for you to get saved. Why? Because your heart is becoming hardened. Just the way it is. Turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 31. Okay, John 8, 31 says, Then said Jesus to the Jews, or to those Jews, which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, you'll hear that a lot of times in the truther movement. You know, you'll hear lost men that are speaking out against the conspiracy, some aspect of the big conspiracy. They'll say, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And usually when they say the truth will set you free, it means that you'll be free to smoke dope, free to fornicate, free to be a pervert, free to swear and cuss and do all kinds of sin. That's not what the Bible's saying there. Read the context. Verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him. Saved. If, if, He didn't say, you know, if you want to do it, maybe if you feel like it. If, 
ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can't steal verse 32 without verse 31. I'm going to be real scientific here and real deep. 31 becomes before 32. Okay? <laughs> you can't take the two, or you can't take 32 without 31. doesn't work. Look at verse 33. And we're going to see some really interesting things here as we go down through these verses. And you're going to notice the contrast between saved and lost, between those who believe the truth and those who believe lies. Okay, verse 33. And Jesus here is speaking to the Jewish religious leaders. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. In other words, it has nothing to do with your race, with your nation. It's talking about sin. And a lot of these people, they understand racial things and, and national and sovereignty and I'm a citizen of the state and all this other stuff. They'll understand that, but they turn right around and they're a slave to sin. They're not free. Okay? Verse 35 and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now, if you have a King James Bible there, you'll notice that the, term, the word father is spelled differently. The first one, Jesus' father, is capital F. Second one, lowercase f. And you say, well, who's the lowercase f father? Well, we're going to see as we continue. Verse 39, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So Jesus says, no, he isn't. Abraham's not your father. Verse 40, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. In other words, Abraham wouldn't have sought to kill Jesus. Verse 41, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus was not born of fornication. They're lying here. Okay, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, not from fornication. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Now look at these next couple verses here. These are really good ones. Verse 43. Why do, you not, why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father. See the lowercase f? Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Hmm. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. There you go. Right there. Where does truth come from? God. Where do lies come from? The devil. Satan. Lucifer. He has different names. He is a deceiver. He's a liar. Where do the lies that those that oppose the truth or movement, where do these lies stem from? Satan. Yeah. You say, well then, are you saying 9-11 truth is actually, you know, goes back to God? Yeah. It goes right back to this book right here. And you need to understand that this 9-11 thing and all the other conspiracy stuff out there is leading up to exactly what the Bible said is going to happen. God's wrath and God's judgment coming on this world for seven years. And God, you say, well that's not fair. It wouldn't be if God didn't provide a way out. 
It wouldn't be a fair thing if you had to go right into judgment along with the lost world. But God has provided a way out. And He tells you what it is in His Word. Salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the way it is. It's right there. Okay, go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 1. It says here, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Thomas is one of the disciples, saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Okay, let me just stop right there for a second. Jesus Christ is saying, I'm preparing a place in heaven, and there are many mansions there, and I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you, for the saved. That's where I'm going. You know about that. And the disciples said, well, yeah, but how do we go? I don't understand. Is there like a road you get on or is there some place where you go and there's a door where you go through and you get to heaven or something? What's the way? Is it some, is it just as long as you seek God in your own way, according to your own beliefs and your own family traditions, that's the way you get into heaven. Is that it? Nope. Verse six, Jesus saith unto him, I am, you see God there? That's God's title, I am. Jesus says, saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Don't fall for the lies of the modern cults out there, religious systems out there that tell you that any way is okay. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven period. No other way. And why would you want another way? As I said earlier, what about these false gods? They don't love their people. They don't tell you what's going to happen in the future. They didn't die for you. They don't do anything for you. Allah won't save you. You know, Mary didn't save anybody. Buddha, Confucius, Zoroaster, you know, just go down through the list of all the losers. Muhammad, whatever. They didn't do anything for their followers. Nothing. Okay? Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Turn to John chapter 16, verse 12. John chapter 16, verse 12 says, uh, Jesus speaking here, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay, right now, if you're not saved, if you're just a truther and you know about the conspiracy, but you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you never put your faith in him, there are some things that are just not going to line up for you. And especially this book, you're going to have a real difficult time understanding this book. God will reveal enough from Scripture to show you that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved. But the deeper meanings of Scripture, the deeper prophecies and everything else, He will show you things to come there, the last sentence. Those things you aren't going to understand until you get saved. Okay, God's Holy Spirit will not reveal those things to you. So if you want to be a full 100% truther, the only way you can do it is to have God's spirit of truth in you. And by the way, that's what happens when you get saved. God the Father, the creator of the universe, his spirit will come into you. Okay, right now you are dead in trespasses and sins. You can't really discern what's truly going on. You can see little aspects of it, but you're missing the full picture, the big picture. And you can only understand that when you have God's Spirit of truth come into you. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 14. 
says here, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. It's interesting because as a truther, quote unquote, you will experience some hatred from the world. The majority of people are, you're not going to get along with the majority of people. Okay? But when you become a Christian, it's going to become even more so. And you say, well, that doesn't seem right. You know, if, if Jesus is such a great guy, why would I be so hated by the world? Because Jesus was. And any follower of his, the more truth you know, the more alienated you will be from the majority of people. It's just that simple. And you say, well, I don't know if I want that much truth. <laughs> well, you better. Okay, John chapter 18, verse 36. Now here, Jesus Christ, as the truth, walking around on the earth, God manifest in the flesh, he is taken and put on trial. You're going to see some interesting things here. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. He doesn't say, my kingdom will never be here on this earth. He says, but now it's not from hence. It will be one day. Uh, you can listen to our message on premillennialism, the coming thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth Heareth my voice. Now here's a very interesting meeting. You have a high level politician, Pilate, talking to a man from the street. And it's God manifest in the flesh. So here you have the truth standing there, the total manifestation of the Godhead standing there in front of this high level politician. And does the high-level politician recognize him? Look at verse 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? <laughs> You're talking to him. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault. Uh, I find in him no fault at all. Hmm. Interesting. Look at over at uh, chapter 19, verse 16. It says here, Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called, into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. Boy, you could do a whole sermon just on that verse right there. But the, the whole thing is Jesus Christ was completely innocent. He was God manifest in the flesh, and he is the truth, and yet they killed him. Okay? He died on that cross. Now we're going to go a couple more scriptures here, and then we're done. Acts chapter 26. I can't cover all the aspects of salvation, but it's just simply Acts chapter 16. Uh... I think it's verse 31 says it best. Uh, as you're turning there to another part. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Okay. Uh, we have a salvation message there on our website that explains a lot more detail of what salvation is, what it means to be saved. But here you have... In the book of Acts, you have the Acts of the Apostles. Those that followed Jesus Christ, what did they do after Jesus Christ rose from the dead? He was crucified. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And then he taught them for a while. 
and then he ascended back up to heaven. And he's up there waiting to come and catch his bride away. And then it's going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. And then he comes back, second coming, judgment of the nations. And then he sets up his kingdom on this earth. But after Jesus ascended back up to heaven, the apostles were going around preaching. And one of the greatest Christians in that time period was a man named Saul, who was persecuting Christians. And later he got saved and changed his name to Paul. Uh, but look at verse 24, Acts chapter 26, verse 24. And you're going to see a parallel here to the way you're treated today as a truther. Paul is on trial here, just like Jesus Christ was on trial. Verse 24, And he, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Verse 25, But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. The politicians get to their positions of power by denying truth and by being good liars. That's what your average politician is. They're a good liar. I mean, show me a politician that speaks the truth and always does what they say they're going to do. I don't know of one. Okay, I don't know of one that, that's got everything figured out and stands for all the right things. Okay, politicians are good liars. And what do they say about those who are truthers? They'll say, much learning doth make thee mad. Interesting. Now we're going to turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Paul knew the truth. And uh, what happened as a result? Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Isn't that interesting? When you know the truth, it will lead to sorrow. Bible back there in Ecclesiastes said about much learning is... Much study is a weariness of the flesh, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth, increaseth sorrow. Talks about that. Isaiah 53 identifies Jesus Christ as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And here you have Paul, the greatest Christian that ever lived, saying he has continual sorrow in his heart. You want to know the truth? You want to be a truther? Well, you're going to experience some sorrow. Okay? Just the way it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Okay, it says here, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. But look at verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Right there, verse 4, talks about the God of this world, which is Satan, okay, and how he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. He's a father of lies. It's right there. It all lines up. Okay, go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. And here's another concept which you're going to see a lot as a truther. <laughs> uh, Galatians 4.16 Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Yeah, most of the time you will be. You'll be considered the enemy. You know, it's funny. If you oppose some of the things that our government is doing here in America, they'll call you anti-government. You're a domestic terrorist. You're a threat. 
No, I'm opposing corruption. Oh no, you're you're the enemy now. It's ridiculous. Okay, it's bad. And as a Christian, a true Christian, you will be viewed as the enemy by the majority of people, including the modern professing Christians. It's the way it is. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 17 through 21. It says here, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being, who being, fat, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. When you are a true truther, when you really know what's going on, it should lead you to be clean and to be righteous and to be a good person. It shouldn't lead you to lasciviousness and uncleanness and greediness. But a lot of people, they find out the truth and they say, well, forget it. I'm just going to be a rotten individual. If these people are going to do this bad stuff to me, then I'm going to do bad stuff to other people. <clears throat> and, you know, the Bible talks in another place about people saying, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Lasciviousness. An overindulgence of animal type behavior. Okay, don't fall for that. Don't, don't just party because things are really bad. If you know some of the truth that's going on, you should be led to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, verse 8. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Okay. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And believe me, I, I picked out some of the best scriptures here on the subject of truth, but there is so much that I couldn't put into this study. You know, it'd be a couple hours long. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That's a key scripture right there. God's word will not work for you. It will not make sense until you believe it. Until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's another very important thing for you to understand. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10. It says here, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Uh, they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now hold on here a second. You say, wait a second, I found a contradiction in the Bible. You said that Satan is the father of lies, that Satan is the deceiver. Satan is the one that is involved with lies. But it says right there, God shall send them strong delusion. Oh, see? Then that proves that God is Satan, according to the Bible. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say God's going to lie to them. It says God shall send them strong delusion. What's that mean? That means God is going to send you Satan. You see, Satan has to get permission before he can deceive people, before he can do evil things. And when you don't receive the love of the truth, and you go to lasciviousness and uncleanness and greediness, and you start sinning and saying, I don't want to hear about Jesus Christ, I don't want to get saved, God says, okay, you're going to get what's coming to you. I can't protect the people that are doing wrong, that are doing evil. So Satan, go ahead. Go on in there. 
Do what you want. You want another 9-11? You want another thousands of people being killed? You want to get away with harp and with with vaccinating people and putting poisons in with it and messing up little kids and CPS coming in and taking people's kids from them, molesting them and God knows what else. You want to get you want to do that stuff, Satan? Go ahead, because those people receive not the love of the truth. And by the way, in context here, the worst deception that's going to come, this this strong delusion that's going to come, hasn't even happened yet. Do you think 9-11 was bad? That's nothing compared to what's going to come down on this earth. And why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. It's right there. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all those, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's the purpose of praying for politicians, so that you can lead a quiet and peaceable life. Not that we can have a wonderful Christian nation and everything goes good. It's just pray, God, keep them people off of our backs. <laughs> um, verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Don't believe in Calvinism, which teaches that God has elected certain people to find the truth and elected certain people to go to hell, and there's nothing they can do about it. That's a lie. God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But it's up to you. Okay, it's your personal personal decision. Verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It's going to make sense when Jesus Christ comes back the second time. Verse 7, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Again, you see the thing of truth. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. You ought to know this one by heart if you're a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. One of the big objections that you're going to have with lost people is they're going to say, why are there so many denominations? If Christianity is it, why are, are there so many denominations? Because they don't follow verse 15. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. Non-dispensational Christians make a mess of the Bible. They mess it all up. Okay, look at chapter 3, verse 7. Make sure that you don't fall for this. Okay? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can learn all about all the conspiracies, all the great big things that are going on in this world, but if you don't come to the knowledge of the truth, the truth being in Christ, the truth being in salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, if you never get that figured out, you wasted your life. Your life means nothing. Okay? Uh, let's see. Where are we at here? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Like 19 Muslims with box cutters hijacking airplanes and the world's most powerful nation and the military stands around going, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And they smash into buildings and the buildings fall down as a result of fire. What is it? It's a fable. It's a ridiculous fable. It defies the laws of science. You know, it's just absurd. But why do they believe it? Because it's a lot easier to believe that a bunch of Muslims can attack America than to believe that your own government is doing it. That's why. And this is talking also, and most specifically, it's talking about the Bible and about professing Christianity. And that's when you, why when you see the modern church and you see the corruption, you know, that's not Christianity. Christianity is found in this book. And Christianity in this book, the King James Bible bears little resemblance to what is called Christianity in America. 
Okay, don't be deceived by that. Uh, James chapter 3. Just about done here. Hit a lot of Scripture today because Scripture is truth. James chapter 3, verse 13. It says here, Who is a wise man and, and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. And I'll tell you right now, a lot of the conspiracy guys, they know the truth about 9-11. They know the truth about the Bilderbergers and the, the Illuminati and the Council on Foreign Relations and, and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the international banksters. But they'll turn right around and they'll lie against the truth of Jesus Christ. They'll lie about what is a true Christian. Right here I have our local paper, Faith and Values section. And over here, Pagans to Celebrate Summer Solstice. In the middle, you have a uh, worth the sacrifice. This young woman was raised a Lutheran, and now she's a Jewish rabbi. Whatever. And over here, Paganism, American style. And down here at the bottom, you have a modern praise and worship church. This is the garbage that the average person sees, and they think this is Christianity. And they say, organized religion is the greatest evil known to man. This isn't Christianity. This isn't what the Bible teaches. The Bible is against all of this stuff. And a lot of people know about 9-11, and they know about all the other stuff, but the real truth that they need to discover, the truth that's in Jesus Christ, the truth that's in the Bible, they reject it because they see this stuff. They see this garbage, this confusion that's called church. See? And they begin to actually speak against Jesus Christ. Why? Because they're ignorant. You might not know what's going on with the world and everything else, but if you don't know what's going on, if you don't study the Bible for yourself and see the difference there between faith in Jesus Christ and this garbage here, the modern professing churches, if you can't see the difference, I feel bad for you. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says here, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Hmm. Uh, don't trust in silver and gold. Okay, that's not the answer to your problems. Okay, that can be taken from you very easily. But it says here, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, not the Constitution. Verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth for ever. For all flesh is grass, is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Again, you see the source of absolute truth there. All right, two more places to turn to, then we're done. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, verse 1. It says here, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. And by the way, that's not just Buddhist and Islam and Hindu and, you know, witchcraft and whatever. Professing Christianity is mostly false prophets. If you take Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, 
you know, down through the list. Most of them are false. Okay, I can tell you that. Real, true, Bible-believing Christians that are born again are very small in number in comparison to professing Christianity. Verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. See the contrast there again? Now look at Third John. We're going to turn to the book of Third John, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 4, and then we're done. It says here, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Verse 3, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. If you are a Christian, you should be walking in the truth. You should not be so cultish in your mind that when somebody presents something to you, you say, I don't, no, I don't even want to study it. I don't even want to hear it. That's the mindset of a cult. You should be willing to talk to anybody about anything. But the Bible says that you need to prove all things. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Whatever you hear needs to line up with this book as a Christian. Okay? The King James Bible is your standard. And if you see something or you hear something that's a conspiracy type of issue and it lines up with a one world government being formed and it lines up with what the Bible says is coming, then you can say, yeah, that's probably true. Maybe I'll, if I have time, maybe I'll study a little bit more in depth. But if somebody says something, and I'm going to pick on Alex Jones because he's one of the big conspiracy guys, he says a lot of good stuff. He talks about the conspiracy, but then when it comes to his philosophy, his philosophy is straight out of the New Age. It's straight out of Satanism. That man is going to bring in a new kingdom, and that man will be ascending to Godhood. That's not what the Bible says. Satan said in the very beginning of your Bible, he said, ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Watch out for these conspiracy guys that tell you you can become God. Another good example is David Icke. David Icke, oh, you know, he knows about the conspiracy. He'll talk about 9-11 and he talks about the Illuminati and whatever else. Yet yeah, he's also a Mason. And he also writes a book called I Am Free, I Am Me. And he came out on national television over in England and they said, do you believe you're Jesus Christ? He said, yes, I do. And he was dead serious. He believes that he is God. Okay, why? Because he's a Satanist. And he might understand some aspects of truth, but he's also, he's not going the whole way. He's not going to Jesus Christ. Okay, watch out for that if you are a truther. Don't end up in hell with the people that you supposedly oppose. If you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to be in hell forever with David Rockefeller and the Rothschilds and all the Adam Wieshaupt, founded the Illuminati, Albert Pike, the Mason that talked about Lucifer, Manly Palmer Hall, Aleister Crowley, all these devil worshippers that helped to build this new world order that's coming, and the Antichrist too, by the way, and Satan. You're going to be in hell for all of eternity with them if you reject Jesus Christ. So, <laughs> you better get saved. Don't quit on the truth movement by going and learning truth about the world, but stopping with the truth of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's fine to learn about the truth of what's going on in the world, but you need to also learn about the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth that's found in the pages of the King James Bible. 
So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, don't fall for the lies of the New Agers, the people that want to lead you away from Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate source of truth. So that's it. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.